Hey, this is John Lee Dumas of EO Fire, and welcome to Master Leadership. Great leaders ask great questions, and this podcast takes you on a journey to master leadership with questions that matter to leaders who matter with your host, Lily Sinabria. Hi, this is Lily, and welcome to Master Leadership, where we connect with leaders worldwide to gain insights on important topics to help us on our journey towards greater significance. If you would like to participate as a guest, or if you have a question that you would like to ask a guest, go to masterleadership.org for more information. Ken Sanginario is the founder of Corporate Value Metric, where they help people increase their company value by 2x to 3x over a three-year period, no matter their situation. Ken has 30 years of experience providing executive leadership and strategic advisory services to private middle market companies, developing and executing business improvement initiatives, turning around distressed operations, managing M&A transactions, valuing companies, and securing equity and debt growth capital. Ken is a frequent speaker at national and regional conferences and private business owner functions and has authored numerous articles on business value growth, corporate valuations, mergers and acquisitions, and turnaround management. Our interview will continue after messages from our sponsors. Did you know that a great accountant can double your business and save you tens of thousands of dollars every single year but it's hard to find the good ones that's where accountant hires comes in they match you with an exceptional accountant in just seven days every accountant in their network is rigorously tested and vetted so you can focus on what matters hire a top accountant today at accountant hires go to masterleadership.org forward slash ah That's masterleadership.org forward slash A-H. If you want to make money and change lives by selling your knowledge online, do not launch an online course. Only 6% of those are ever completed. Create instead your own branded app and launch the ultimate learning experience that sells. Passion.io is a drag and drop platform where you create interactive content to sell using your own branded app. Forget any tech hassles. You deserve a platform that makes it easy. You can move your existing clients, you can reach new clients, or you can even swap your online course for something that actually works. Delight clients with downloadable and even live content. You can trigger instant action using push notifications, generate more revenue with single touch payment, and you can stream across all devices. Best yet, try it for free for 14 days. Go to masterleadership.org forward slash passion and get started today. Welcome, Ken Sanginario. How are you? I'm doing great, Lily. Thanks for having me. We're excited to have you. Are you ready to pour into our listeners? I'm ready. Absolutely. Awesome. All right. So Ken, (laughs) tell us a bit about your path to leadership and what you're doing now. I started off my career almost 40 years ago now, and I had somewhat of a straight path for maybe the first 10 to 15 years. Came up through the accounting ranks. I worked for one of the, what was the big eight accounting firms back when they were the big eight, and then took the natural pathway into the corporate world as a corporate controller, and then as a CFO and so forth. And then my path sort of took a right turn in one of those corporate roles because I found myself as an executive in a public company that was in deep financial difficulty. It was unexpected. I got recruited into the company and unbeknownst to me, they had all of this trouble. So I didn't find that out until I actually started working. And my first inclination was I should turn and run for the hills because this is not what was represented. But I thought, well, maybe there's something I can learn here. I think I'll stick it out and see what I can do. Well, that turned into a three-year-long, grueling turnaround and workout of a whole portfolio of companies that this public holding company owned with major financial institutions involved and several unions. And it was an absolute grueling experience that 
had a successful result and that sort of changed the course of my career forever. So oh. since then, including the, those three years, I spent 18 years then turning around underperforming and distressed companies, both as an executive inside companies and as a turnaround advisor where I would be engaged to take over the running of companies for anywhere from six to 18 months, develop and execute a turnaround strategy, and then recapitalize or sell the company on the back end or let it continue operating. That kind of work gets in your blood when you do it. It becomes somewhat addictive. So that was the right-hand <laughs> turn that my career took. And I kind of never looked back, but that took another turn right during the last recession in 2008 and nine, when I started developing a standardized approach to diagnosing companies, healthy companies and distressed companies to very efficiently and comprehensively be able to identify where their relative strengths and weaknesses were, where their constraints were. Where were the risks in the companies that would prevent them from growing and creating value? And in the worst case, could cause them to implode if they weren't addressed. In a, over a five-year period, I developed a software platform that we now license to advisors around the world. That led to the creation of an educational program, a, a very rigorous, it's a five-day long program for advisors that teaches advisors how to follow that kind of a process with their clients and create value. Because we say most private companies at least could double or triple in value over a three to five year period if they only knew the secrets of how to do that, how to understand where their blind spots are, where their weaknesses are. And so now my focus is on the software development and licensing, the educational program, and I still do a fair amount of direct consulting myself. So sort of three prompts. I don't rest much, <laughs> but that's what I'm doing now. Long Forget to... about retirement. <laughs> no, no, never retire. <laughs> um, so I love this story because to think if you had cut and run, mm. it would have turned out so differently. And I love the fact that you decided I'm going to stick with it and see what I can learn. And it shows me your resiliency too, because you stuck with it for three years and how you adapted also. And the creativity, we don't correlate accounting with creativity, but you were creative right. and that you created something out of it, um, yes. a career, a whole career, yeah. which is really so smart. This standardized approach to diagnosing companies, extremely valuable. Now, where can we get more information on that? The company is called Corporate Value Metrics, M-E-T-R-I-C-S. And our website is corporatevalue.com. And on the website, we have a link to a demo of the software and links to descriptions of the educational program and so forth. It's all there on the website. Ken, thank you so much. Now, as a man who has pivoted often, <laughs> even mm -hmm. before it was popular or the thing to do, you're experienced in this. And we're recovering from the global pandemic, COVID-19. I don't know anymore. I, I know. <laughs> but, but I'm certain you learned a couple of things. So are there any quote, advice, or practice that helps you most during crisis? Yeah, I think the philosophy that I've always had during crisis, especially in the turnaround world, it's a crisis a day. It's a very simple philosophy. Don't panic. And I think it's the natural reaction of most people when they're faced with crisis to panic to some degree or another, some more than others. But panic blocks your ability to think clearly through problems. It blocks your ability to see the pathway that is there. There almost always is a pathway through crisis. I would say 99% of the time, there's a pathway. And you have to be able to step back and sort of disengage yourself from the moment and be able to look clearly and see and find that path through the crisis. And if you can do that in a calm manner, you're much more likely to find the path and be able to succeed through it. If you're panicked, if you're stressed out about it, you biologically, as I've been reading lately, you biologically cannot think clearly. Your brain doesn't function the same way when you're under a lot of stress. So that's always been my philosophy. And now 
I'm learning a little bit more about the science of why Find that it. works. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it's, it's easy to say, don't panic. Right. Um, right. And so is this something that's innate in you or did you have to learn this? A little of both, but I think I have a natural calm kind of personality. You know, whenever I went into turnaround situations, I mean, sometimes I would get a call from say a private equity firm on a Thursday or Friday afternoon and they'd say, Hey, you know, can we have this portfolio company out in the Midwest somewhere? And they're telling us they're not going to make payroll next Thursday. They're asking us for an infusion and we don't know whether we should give it to them or shut it down. And can you be on the ground on Monday morning and let us know by Wednesday whether we should fund their payroll on Thursday or not? And so I'd have to get on the ground. They weren't all, of course, that level of crisis, but there were times when it was that much of a crisis. And people used to tell me that for some reason, we all just, as soon as you walk in, we feel calmer about wow. the situation. And nothing that I even said, they didn't know me. I think it's just, I don't know. Your I, demeanor. My demeanor, I guess. I, <laughs> I, I, they can sense that I'm not panicked. I think you can sense when people are in a panic. So they could sense that I wasn't panicked. And I think that helped a lot. And we always found a pathway through but we had to very quickly get to the root of the problems in the company in those cases, and then be able to properly advise the investors or the owners of how they should handle it. So, yeah, you know, I've interviewed quite a few people and there's several of them who actually thrive during crisis. Like when it hits the fan, they are the calmest and they can think clearer. Is mm -hmm. that you? I think under pressure, I tend to think clearer. When I have too much time on my hands, very little gets done. When I have almost no time, I seem to get a lot done. And it's not short cutting anything, it's just focus. I might need some of that kind of pressure to get me to really focus hard. <laughs> Your superpower, Ken, I love it. All right, so as a lifelong learner, Ken, what are you learning right now? It's a great question. Probably the biggest thing I'm learning right now is how to build a community. When we developed our software and created our educational program, we licensed the software, as I mentioned, to advisors all around the world. And what I found was the more people that were using our software and using our education, they weren't connecting with each other because they didn't necessarily know each other. But they all were sharing their ideas of best practices with me and what works and what doesn't. And how they're gaining clients and what kind of impact they're making with their clients and how this whole process is working. And it was only recently, I would say during this pandemic when people were even more kind of isolated from networking and events and you know, not being able to go to conferences and things like that where they would meet colleagues. I started thinking about how do I connect all of these people who have a common interest and a common passion for helping companies to create value. And I started holding these monthly community calls of all of our practitioners who use our software and, and education. And I started learning about how to build this community and make it stronger and then connecting individuals with other individuals where I thought they would have common interests. And, I'm seeing new partnerships, new collaborations develop out of those phone calls and out of the virtual meetings that we're holding. And now we've, we're creating a community platform within our website where they can log on and directly share their ideas or challenges or problems, whatever, or opportunities with each other and connect with each other so everybody can have their kind of bio listed and so forth, their fields of expertise and their geographical location. So it's a way to build a community that I've never known how to do that before, but I'm getting great feedback about it. And I think people are really enjoying it. Such an important thing to do, especially since you've built an educational platform and program, an important next step. You know, I know someone and I'd love to connect you with him. His name is Paul Martinelli. I don't know if you've heard of Paul Martinelli, but he was the co-founder of the John Maxwell team. And okay. he's excellent at building community. He has like oh, wow. 2 million followers, um, wow. the Howard Living page. 
I'd love to connect you guys. Would you be interested in doing that? Yeah, absolutely, of course. I'd love okay, to meet so, you. Uh, he's You're... a Martinelli. He's Italian. Hey. All right. Okay. <laughs> we'll, we'll get along well. <laughs> love it. Love it. All right. Now, Ken, when you think of leadership today, what most concerns you and what are you most hopeful about? In the business world, I have kind of one thought and in kind of in the macro world, I kind of have a different thought. Okay. In the macro world, I'm really concerned about world peace because I, I just think the tensions around the world, they're getting worse and worse. They're not getting better. And I think the world leaders have a huge task ahead of them. And I'm concerned about it, about whether the world leaders will be able to keep this world from going down a dark path. Hopefully they will, but that worries me. And I think if the world was at peace, so many more resources would be available to solve all of the other problems, the environmental issues and the, you name it, just Creativity. world hunger and everything. If all the resources could be redeployed in a peaceful way to all of these other problems, instead of into everybody's militaries, I think we could solve all the world problems, but I'm not sure the world leaders will ever get to that point. Hopefully someday, but taking it down more to the micro level in the business world where I live and work and most of us do, I'm concerned about the private company marketplace because there are some 6 million private companies in the U.S. alone. And about 70% of them are owned by the baby boomer generation. And they will have to transition their businesses sometime over the next 10 years. The wave is happening already. I think the whole pandemic maybe even accelerated that wave. They took a hit in the beginning of the pandemic. And now they're just saying, we made it through the couple of recessions. We made it through the, like, I'm done. I don't want to wait for another crisis to face. I want to sell now. I want to get out. So if you think about 70%, that's, you know, roughly four, four and a half million businesses and about 85 to 90% of them are not sellable today because they are not of high enough quality and value to support the owner's lifestyles after they transition. And if they can't exit their businesses on timing in terms that are appealing that can support themselves, then those companies, a lot of them will end up liquidating at some point when those owners are no longer able to run their companies and there are no buyers. Those companies employ about 50% of the employed workforce in the US. So I sometimes refer to it as this economic freight train that is bearing down on us that nobody seems to be paying attention to. If all of these companies, or if a lot of these companies end up liquidating, what will happen to the employed workforce? Those people, some of them, of course, would get rehired, re-engaged by other companies and so forth. But a lot of them, I think, will find themselves out of work. You know, I'm not an economist. This is just me kind of thinking way down the road about what's coming at us. And I could see this having a big impact on unemployment in the U.S., And to bring it back to a leadership point, the leaders of these companies are unaware of the challenges that they will be facing when they decide they want or need to transition out of their companies. Most of them, it's going to be like a very cold wake up call to them because a lot of business owners that I've met over the years, and I hear the same stories from other advisors, they all think that they could sell their companies at will. And maybe it will take them six to 12 months, but they don't realize that 90% of them won't sell at all unless they really undertake some major initiatives to strengthen the quality and the value of their companies. They may be profitable. That doesn't mean they're sellable. It doesn't mean somebody else will buy them. So for our listeners who are in that position, what's something that they can do right now? Yeah. So virtually every company that I've ever met in my 40 years, they're all strong in some aspects of their business. Usually it's the product or service that they provide because that's what got them into business in the beginning. The owner and founder, they had an expertise. They had an idea that fit with their expertise and they thought they wanted to build a company around that. And so they're very good at that aspect of their business. That's only about 10% of running their companies. 
they may be very weak to certain degrees in all of the other 90% of the company, that wasn't their expertise. And in some of those areas of the companies, they have strong people who can handle them, but they all have blind spots in their right. companies. They all have areas of the companies that are weaker than the rest. Right. And they typically don't know where those are. And they don't realize that those weaker points, weaker areas are the constraints to them growing the company and creating value. And they try to chase revenue and chase profitability as a way to create value, thinking that revenue and profitability are levers unto themselves. They're drivers unto themselves and they're not. Those are results, they're not drivers. The results are all of the qualitative attributes throughout the company that actually do drive the company forward. And revenue and profitability growth are results. They're byproducts of doing all of the other things correctly. Having a company in balance is critical. So I think business owners need to start to think about their companies they need to get another perspective. They need to have somebody help them shine a light on the areas of the companies where they're weak, because that's what's holding them back. Yeah, and I think they need to go to corporatevalue.com and get some resources there, right? And get that <laughs> software, you know. That well, that's a diagnostic. Can. Yeah, that serves that purpose. And that's yeah. kind of why I created it, because I mean, my passion is to create value. That's the mission of our firm is to create value. And it doesn't only mean financial value. Right. It means value to everybody with whom we engage. And it might mean financial value. It might mean the value of fulfillment. It might mean the value of educating somebody, making them better at what they do, raising them up if they're down. That's our mission. That's our passion. And the reason that I created the software was because I can only serve a handful of clients and I'm limited. But if I could do this brain dump of, you know, 35 years of turnaround experience in M&A and business valuation and all the backgrounds that I've been trained in, if I could codify that and put it out to the world, to the advisory world and teach them how to do it, then collectively, we could create a lot of value, financial and otherwise, and have a much bigger impact on the economy. And Ken, you certainly are adding value. Thank you. That's one of the pillars to me of great leadership. So I appreciate that. Now, the second part of that question was, what are you most hopeful about when you think of leadership today? I'm hopeful that some world leaders will either come around and become more collaborative with the other world leaders, or that some new world leaders will come into position where they can change the path that we're on, which is just higher and higher tensions. In the business world, I'm really hopeful that the younger generation will come along and develop and mature in their development. It's amazing. It's mind-blowing to me, the knowledge that the younger generation, the millennials, and even the nexters or whatever the next generation is after the millennials, the knowledge that they have at such young ages and the talent they have and the perspectives they have and the global just understanding of things Mm -hmm. that they have is mind blowing to me. When I think back to what I knew when I was their age compared to what they know now is like, but I think they have a lot of maturing to do and they have the power to move the world and move markets. I think it's inconsistent right now, the way that they deploy that power. Sometimes it's for good. Sometimes it's for greed. Sometimes it's, you know, for other reasons that are not creating a lot of value. So I'm just hoping that the younger generation matures and understands the best way they can use the knowledge and the clout, the power that they have. You know, I often speak about how wonderful to be able to collaborate intergenerationally Mm. and to have those conversations that will up-level our thinking together. That's fantastic. Now you have an option here. You can take a question from a former guest, or you can share a challenge or struggle that you learned from. I'll take the question from the guest, I guess. That's a risky okay. one, but I'll, I'll, I'll go you, for it. I'm a risky, a risky guy. You're a risky guy. Yeah. All right, Ken. All right. So Casa Grant wants to know, what is the number one skill that has helped you the most as a leader? Very interesting. Um, I think the number one skill for me has been versatility. 
I've tried to, over the course of my career, build as much knowledge as I could in a lot of different fields. And I've tried to get involved in companies in ways that you mentioned earlier, oh, you're not a typical accountant. I left the accounting world behind, you know, 25 years ago, but that knowledge is still there. At every opportunity, I've tried to get involved in other new challenges in companies that I had never experienced before, whether they're operational challenges or financial challenges, whatever they were, and to take positions in turnaround situations and so forth that were sometimes new and somewhat scary. But I was never afraid to jump in both feet, just put the hip waders on and figure it out. And I think that has given me a versatility of perspectives that I can bring to lots of different situations and the ability to work with people with all kinds of different perspectives on whatever the challenges are that they're facing and be able to bring people together and solve problems and basically to create value. So I absolutely agree. Versatility is your jam. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. All right. So Ken, as a listener of this podcast, what's a question that you would like a future leadership guest to respond to? Like, what are you curious about? I would love to know how those leaders are creating value in their organizations, in their communities, with their colleagues. What are they doing to create value? That is a great question. So thank you. That, yes. Now, is there anything else you'd like to share with our listeners? I would just suggest that people focus on what is really positive in your lives. No matter what kind of stress or problems people are facing, it could be a thousand times worse if you look around the world and really see what people that are facing real problems are encountering. And, you know, just keep things in perspective, focus on the positives. Let's make it a great year. It's a new start. It's a fresh start. Hopefully everybody is staying safe. Right. And hopefully next year will be a great year and a return to more normalcy for everyone. And that's a great way to close us out. And again, your website is corporatevalue.net. Make sure Correct. you hop in there, learn more about Ken's work. It's been such an honor to speak to you. Thank you so much for adding value to me and to our listeners. It's been a great Thank you, Lily. Thank you for having me on your podcast. It's been a pleasure. In closing, here's a quick message. Coaching is the art of influence that underpins leadership in the 21st century. It is the very thing that can get you from being stuck to being extraordinary. So go to masterleadership.org and sign up to get a free coaching session. Until next time, continue to ignite that leader in you.